Coming up today, one of the best ways to fly between Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires. On board a British Airways A350 in their new Club World Suites. Is British Airways finally turning a corner? The full trip report starts in 15 seconds. I arrived at Sao Paulo's Guarulhos Airport a bit before 5 a.m., and while I wasn't expecting a madhouse, I have to say I was expecting it to be a bit busier than this. Check the pinned comment below for my exact fare, as well as what I think the flight is actually worth. Plus, you'll get a preview into my next week's worth of content. My check-in process was seconds long. Actually, I checked in 24 hours ahead of time in order to snag my preferred seat as I didn't want to pay BA's insane $117 to select a business class seat ahead of time. This route between Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires is a really interesting one. In addition to the hometown carriers that fly the route, you can also fly it as a fifth freedom segment on British Airways, Ethiopian, Air Canada, Swiss, Turkish, and more. Fifth freedom refers to a route that an airline has the right to sell to a local market that doesn't originate or land in the carrier's actual country. The current situation is a result of COVID and time zones. Aircraft from the US and Western Europe tend to spend long periods of time on the ground in deep South American destinations in order to time their flights better. That plus many airlines not needing separate non-stop services to both of these cities. It created a new niche market for the tag on routes. Security and immigration, as you'd expect it, took about a minute or two tops, and soon we were heading up to the lounge. While the Amex lounge is the one that smacks you in the face as you head upstairs, it didn't open until 9am. So we headed to the Latam lounge, which was included with my fare. I ended up absolutely loving this lounge. It's big, open, has decent food options, and has plenty of smaller, more private areas if you're not looking for a big hustle and bustle. Throughout the morning, the lounge was quiet as you see here, but the following week on my way to London I passed through again and it was absolutely packed. While there were always seats available, one thing that I only noticed that later week visit was the lack of workstations. I had a long layover and I was trying to get some editing done ended up sitting at one of the dining tables for three hours, which just isn't ideal to get work done with so many people walking by. But overall, a fantastic space and much better than I would expect to be honest. Also appreciated that in addition to the shower rooms that were available, all of the bathroom stalls were all their all individual little rooms with sinks and counter space. Our incoming aircraft from London landed over an hour late, which delayed our departure by about 30 minutes. After I saw her touch down from the lounge, I headed out towards the gate to stretch my legs and check out which aircraft I'd be able to see. Soon enough, I found my 18-month-old A350-1000. While I've flown many A350s, it's my favorite aircraft, today was my first time on board the stretched 1000 model. Not that I noticed any difference from it up front though, but it's still a nice box to tick off my list. I actually really like this part of Terminal 3. It's massively oversized and boxy in a way that only Brazil could really pull off. But the windows are fantastic and provided some really great apron views. Around half past seven, it was time to finally board, and this was pretty much everyone boarding the flight from Sao Paulo. And can't really say that there were that many on board already. First impressions when walking on board were excellent. It comes off as just straight purple on the camera, but the blue and red mood lighting were a nice touch. 
Let's check out the best and the worst seats on board. These super stretched A350s have a total of 331 seats in their very premium setup with 219 in economy, 56 in premium economy, and 56 in business class or club world as they're called. When British Airways debuted their original Club World suite in the early 2000s, it was without a doubt revolutionary. The first truly fully flatbed in business class. These new seats are fantastic, but not quite revolutionary. They went with the Collins Aerospace Super Diamond seat with doors, a very popular seat in the industry. So yes, first of all, every seat does have its own sliding door, which I think is more of a gimmick if I'm honest. In terms of seats to avoid, Row 11 and 15 are probably the worst choices due to the high traffic around the bathrooms, especially during a busy flight. For the best seats, it's just a small thing, but the window seats in rows 9 and 10 have two full windows, whereas every other one just has one, so I chose 9 kilo for myself today. The seats are super comfortable and a great option for long haul flying as there's plenty of really well designed storage. Besides the reading light over your shoulder, there's a side cabinet for headphones. Each seat comes with a full bedding kit, which we'll check out a bit later. In front, under the leg rest, there's also plenty of room for a carry-on, with another cubby storage area beside it. The side table opens up to show two compartments, and I appreciate the positioning of the outlets inside here, which are easier to access than on American's configuration of the same seat. For sure I got my two windows, but unfortunately no overhead vents. As our cousin from Madrid pulled up alongside, we began to get a sense of how empty this flight would be and how friendly the flight crew were. When I look at flight crews, I really just look for three things. Professional but friendly, attentive when you need it, and clearly enjoy their jobs. This crew ticked all of the boxes and were just as excited to see the beautiful approach into Buenos Aires as I was, which you'll see a little bit later on. All in all, pushback started around 30 minutes late, but we landed just 10 minutes behind schedule. Today we'd be taking off from runway 9 left, on our way up to 40,000 feet for our 1,000 mile journey south to Ezezia's runway 11. On a clear day, our flight plan would have given us spectacular views of the city below, but at least above the clouds was blue as always. The spool up is coming up next. I love that hum. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing for two new videos each week. Always feel free to ask any questions in the comments, I make sure to reply to all of them. Also, if you enjoy full length takeoff, cruising, or landing and approach videos, please check out my new Roam Above channel where you can watch this flight's full length takeoff and the spectacular 25 minute approach and landing in Buenos Aires. Links are in the description below and a huge thank you in advance for checking it out. A bit more light now, we can take a better look at some of the seat details. The IFE system, meaning the moving maps and the content selection itself, was very good, but the touch screen, my screen at least, was not the greatest. Everything worked fine from the separate remote though once everything was rebooted.
For a short flight, the headphones were decent, but nothing special. The bedding, all by the white company, was all very nice though. From a substantial pillow, to a proper mattress pad, and a real blanket. It all made for a pretty comfortable cocoon. Onto those gimmicky doors. They're so short and mine didn't even work. Luckily, when we landed, the door in front of me slammed closed though, so at least you get to see what it looks like. Unless you're around four feet tall though, you'll be able to see straight into each seat with the doors open or closed. The meal service started soon after takeoff. Had a choice of a ham and turkey panini or a vegetable panini. For the flight, I'd say it was appropriate and overall the meal was tasty, especially that little pumpkin salad and the sweet potato chips. A very autumnal vibe on the first day of spring. I spent the rest of my flight filming out the windows while crossing over Uruguay and then popping into the restroom to freshen up before landing. The bathroom was clean throughout, as you'd expect with such a light load, and was stocked with white company products as well. Soon, we were crossing over the Rio de la Plata, which is the border between Uruguay and Argentina, on our descent. We would be flying directly over Buenos Aires and Ezezia Airport itself, before swinging around and landing. Enjoy the views. An exceedingly uneventful taxi brought us to the terminal alongside some European neighbors. Entering Argentina, a country well known for its paperwork, was astonishingly easy and before I knew it, I was in the always chaotic arrivals area looking for my driver. That's all there is to write for this one, so let's get into the flip-flop score. Great stuff all around. The most points were lost because it took me days and hours on the phone to pay precisely $1, which was the total taxes and fees for my Avios ticket. And of course, they wouldn't accept web payment. Everything else though was fantastic and ended up with a well-deserving 92 out of 100 for this unique fifth freedom flight. I really hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for two new flight or hotel reviews each week. Next up, join me at the Palladio Hotel, an M Gallery property in Buenos Aires.